So when we look at this passage of scripture, I want to start with the end, uh, which it deals with women in ministry, and then I'm going to back up to the beginning and just run through uh, this chapter. So um, some of you have grown up in church where you, you've experienced ladies as in leadership and it's not been a big deal to you. Others have grown up in, in church where it has been a big deal and, and, and there's been some teaching on this that may not line up with some of the things that I might say this morning. Uh, also, if you look at our ministry here in our church, we have Pastor Andrea, we have Pastor Michaela, we have Pastor Denica, and we have Pastor Elaine. So obviously, we do believe in women taking a role in leadership and teaching in the church. So I'll just start there, so don't throw anything at me today, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> Let me just start there. But actually, when you look at what Paul is teaching here, Paul is not subjugating women. Actually, Paul is elevating women. Uh, but you need to understand the context of which Paul is speaking to. He's speaking to an early church. He's speaking to a basically a new church plant. And he's speaking to Timothy, who is leading this church. And he's saying, Timothy, in the culture that you're in, you need to have some rules and regulations in place that will help the church to be healthy. Remember the first chapter, he talks about false doctrines and things being taught. Chapter 2, is he's also following up on that. Chapter 3, he talks about leaders in the church. But so in chapter 2... As he addresses this, you need to understand, and we need to take into context what is going on. The Greek culture, the Greek culture at the time, and the Hebrew culture at the time, did not necessarily educate women. Uh, women were educated if a family was wealthy, and the father of the wealthy family deemed it necessary for his daughter to be educated. Otherwise, women weren't formally educated. Women were expected to uh, do domestic duties and to work in the home and, and to lead in the home, and, but they weren't necessarily always educated. Wealthy women that were educated... Something was happening in the Greek culture at the time. Wealthy women who were educated, if their husbands died and they actually were left the estate, some of these women were actually becoming priestess in cult religions. And when they were becoming priestess in cult religions, they were taking on leadership roles in those cult religions. What was happening in the early church is you had ladies that were wealthy getting saved, seeing the same thing happening with their other friends that were wealthy in these cult religions taking on places of leadership, but they weren't necessarily educated. And if they weren't, were educated, they weren't educated in what we would consider the Torah or what we read in the Old Testament about who God really is. And they weren't educated in who Jesus was and is and what Jesus had done. So they're taking leadership roles and teaching things that they didn't know anything about. Would you want them leading you? Right. So that's what Paul is addressing in this passage of Scripture. So as we go through that, keep that in your mind. But Paul does do some things, I believe, in this passage where he elevates women. So let's take a look. We're going to jump down to verse 9. And it says, And I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and, and not draw attention to themselves by the way that they fix their hair or wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things that they do. Now, we understand this in today's culture, even women, to be modest in what we wear. To, to be appropriate in what they wear. My, you know, I've got two daughters that have grown up and we've always told them, and Andrea's done a great job of this especially, girls, you need to make sure that what you're wearing is appropriate. You need to make sure what you're wearing is modest. You need to wear that shirt a little bit lower on your butt because those things show too much. Well, let's just be honest. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Grandma understands. Modesty. And what Paul is trying to teach the early church is not about what you wear. It's about who you are. It's not about the outside or how you dress up the outside. It's what God is doing on the inside. And what's on the inside, when that comes out, that's more appealing than anything that you can wear. And Paul is challenging the early church. It's not about your status in the world. It's about what God is doing in your heart. 
That's how God is changing you. It's not about what you wear. It's about who you are. And the transformation that God wants to do in all of us, not just women, but in all of us and how he wants to transform us because we can cover up other things by what we wear, right? Fine clothes can cover a bad spirit. Fine clothes can cover things that we don't want others to know about us. That we look one way in public, but we act another way in private. So what Paul is addressing, he's he's addressing that you can't just look good. You need to be transformed. You need to be transformed by what God wants to do in your life. He goes on in verse 11, and he says, women should learn quietly. Now, understand, this is important to understand what Paul is saying here. He said they should learn. At the time, women weren't being educated. Think about the culture again. He's saying women should learn. He was elevating them from the, just the very start of the church that women have a right to learn. Women have a right to be educated. Women, now, in today's society, you're like, well, yeah, that's not. Back then, it wasn't. So he's elevating. Women should learn. But then he uses a term here that actually refers to the way that rabbis would teach men at the time. He said women should learn quietly and submissively. Quietly, submissively, I'll just jump down to this. It was the way that rabbis taught their disciples at the time. And rabbis only taught men. Called them to discipleship, to listen, believe, and practice. Learn submissively meant to listen, listen, believe, and practice. Think about how Jesus taught. Jesus taught his disciples to listen to what he was saying. They learned as they dialogued and lived with him, and then he sent them out to practice. So Paul is actually elevating women in the early church to listen, learn, then practice, not the other way around. Because what was happening is they were practicing and teaching without listening and learning. And he was calling them to that. Now understand, again, men had already been taught as, as young men the prophetic the books of the or the books of the Old Testament, the Torah and the, the prophetic writings when they were growing up. So that when they talk about Jesus being the Messiah and Jesus fulfilling prophecy and Jesus being the one that gives us relationship with God, men had a leg up. We understand that, right? Because of what they've been taught. Women didn't. So he's saying, listen, learn, and then practice. Let me go back to this passage. So do not let a woman teach a man to have authority over them. Let them listen, learn, listen quietly, for God made Adam first. Now, there are some things that Paul says that I just wish I could tell you, Paul, could you say that in a better way? Just, just, just rephrase that, Paul. But he doesn't. So you have to then again go back into the context of what he's saying and what he's referring to. He says, for God made Adam first, afterwards made Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, you have Adam and Eve in the garden, and you have Eve tempted by Satan. And it says that Satan tempted Eve. Where does it say Adam is? It's not that Adam is on the other side of the garden and and Eve didn't take the apple or whatever it was and eat of the fruit and then run to the other side of the garden and say, Adam, look what I found. This is so amazing. You got to try this. No, it says that Adam was there with her. He was standing right beside her. She's deceived. She takes the fruit. She eats the fruit. She gives it to Adam who is standing beside her and he eats also. What was wrong with Adam that he didn't say, don't touch that? Like, seriously. What was wrong with Adam that he didn't stand up for his wife? That he didn't identify something that was going on. Yes, she might have taken the first bite, but he condoned it. So the challenge in this passage of Scripture is when he refers to to Eve sinning first... He qualifies it, but what else he says? And if it was not, and it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan, but Adam fell into the same deception. 
Now, he's not, again, subjugating women because, remember, Paul's teaching. Anything that Paul teaches, there's different areas where he teaches in Romans chapter 16 and Acts chapter 18 where he lists these different female leaders in the church, deaconess in the church that took positions of teaching. Again, he's referring to this uh, Ephesian setting, Ephesus setting, where, where Timothy is raising this new church. Now, it goes on here in verse 14 and 15. It says, women was deceived and sin was the result. But what he says next helps us to understand why he's referring to her. He says, but women will be saved through childbearing. Now, what he's talking about is women, if if you've never had a child, it's not that you can't be saved. The word here, saved, means to, to bring to safety. Women will be brought to safety through childbearing, meaning that women as a word or as a being in the whole will be saved by childbearing. And what is he talking about? Again, he goes back to Genesis chapter three, when God addresses Satan. And when God addresses Satan, he looks at Satan and says, the seed of woman will crush your head. And what he's saying to Satan at the moment is, yes, you were able to deceive Eve, but it's through her that I'm going to crush what you've done. And Jesus is the answer to that. That through woman, through women, (laughs) Jesus came into the world. And because of Jesus, the victory that Satan was able to get was destroyed. So God turned it all around. So women, never let anyone say that you're the reason, you're the solution. And if you've had teaching along the way that says that women are less than men, you didn't bring Jesus into the world. God chose woman to bring Jesus into the, to bring the solution. And Paul refers to this here. He's not putting women down. He's actually elevating women. And it's important for us to get that when it comes to church because you miss a whole thing about the women that can lead in a different way than men can in order to build the body of Christ up. But women should be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and and modesty. Now, he qualifies this again, that women, and I, I believe that there's a lesson in here about the role of women. Because remember, before this, men were the teachers. Women were the ones that just kind of helped with the home and the domestic things. But uh, I believe at this point, too, Paul is elevating them, saying, if you continue to live in, in, in righteousness, if you continue to follow God, then you will be saved. But not just you will be saved. You'll be saving that next generation saved by teaching the next generation to be obedient to God. That as mothers in the home, that they have this responsibility to speak into the next generation so the next generation doesn't get deceived. Becoming teachers the moment they have children. See, uh, Paul doesn't put down women. He lifts them up. He corrects things in the early church that were happening so that the early church could be healthy and the early church could thrive and they could set the standard of what God desired for community and what he desires for his church, for the body of Christ. To teach the next generation (coughs) not to be deceived, to to live the way that God designed us to live. See, Paul's desire is is sound doctrine all the time. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It's always about sound doctrine, not to subjugate women. Unfortunately, this passage of scripture has been used in the church to subjugate women. And if when you were growing up or somewhere along the line, you heard this and it was spoken to your life that men lead women. Yeah, our responsibility is to lead. We'll get there in a minute. But it's not to subjugate women. And it's not that women can't lead you. Norell is the only one going to be in, in the good books when he goes home today. And it's like, the rest of you are in the doghouse. Your wife is waiting for you to say, amen. amen. Yeah. 
Okay, let's jump back to the beginning of 1 Timothy, and then this is going to come all together here for you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I urge you, first of all, again, remember, he's talking to the early church. He's talking to Timothy and how to establish the governance in the early church and the priorities for the early church. He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf, not just, well, God bless that person, but intercede to stand in the gap between what you see God wants to do and what you see happening in society, what you see happening in people's lives. Stand in the gap and bring God into the solution that every stronghold will be removed, that that, that God's authority will reign in people's lives and they'll be set free. Stand in the gap on their behalf and give thanks for them. I, I love this next part because it really challenges me sometimes. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that they may live, so that we may live peaceful, quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. We have to understand, again, the culture and, and what was going on and the persecution in the area. And, and Paul says, man, pray that, that you have favor with the leaders in your community. Pray that you live in peace so the gospel can continuously go forward, that there's no limitations to the gospel of Jesus being spread throughout the regions. Pray for your leaders. You know, I, I think about our, our, our pre, prime minister. <laughs> I think about our premier too, but our prime minister and our prime minister, I mean, how many of us pray for his marriage? How, how many of us really stand in the gap on behalf of him? Think about it. The most visible person in our country, the one that carries one of the greatest weights, whether you like his policies or not, scripture tells us pray for those in authority. Whether you like him or not, How many of us have prayed for his marriage? How many of us have stood in the gap for his kids? Right? Paul says, intercede. Intercede on their behalf. That God would work in their lives. We need that. But one of the things I really want to draw out of this is when we think about prayer, How important is it really to us? I could bring in a great worship leader. This place will be packed. I could bring in an intercessor, and there'll be like 50 of you here. What does Paul say? Does he say, come together and shout and holler? He says, make a foundation of your ministry, prayer. Make the foundation of the church, prayer. Now, I know we can pray at home, and I do, and I know you do. And I encourage you throughout the summer to be praying through every street in your community. Pray over every single house. Go for prayer walks over your neighbors and just pray over every house. Let Holy Spirit show you things to pray for and just stand in the gap for them and intercede on behalf of them. But the foundation of every ministry isn't programs. We've got great programs. We've got a phenomenal, we got one of the best youth ministries in the city, maybe in the province. It's like, I'm not kidding, we do. And we've got one of the best children's ministries. We really do. But it's not programs, it's prayer that moves the hand of God, it's prayer that solves problems. And I want to challenge you that that has to be the foundation of your home. It has to be the foundation of this ministry. And it's what we're going to see God do things through. We need to have an urgency in our hearts for prayer. We need to have an urgency in our hearts for what God wants to do and see it and and then step into it and stand in the middle between his kingdom coming and what's happening on earth and bring it to earth. It's prayer. Prayer, prayer and intercession is not a program of the church. It is the foundation of the activity of God. It's the foundation of God doing something we can't do. Now, we know how to do church. I've been trained in that. Our staff has been trained in that. But man, we've got to have prayer as the foundation. 
prayer for freedom of the gospel, Paul says. Prayer for freedom of the gospel. Prayer, prayer for peace in the land and laws that honor God. That we have individuals in places of authority that aren't restricting the gospel message from going forward. I had a meeting this week with a young man that's a missionary overseas in a restricted access nation where the gospel is illegal uh, to preach or you know, to lead someone to Christ is illegal and you could be thrown in jail because uh, it's considered... Um, well, it's, it's illegal, but it, it's considered wrong. And, 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 you know, I was talking to him about, you know, where he's going, what he's doing, and why he's doing it. And he said, man, when I was a teenager on a missions trip, uh, somebody asked me when I was leaving that missions trip, when are you coming back? And he said, my natural in my heart was, well, I'm never coming back. I'm going back to Canada. And, and, but the moment I said that, God spoke to me and said, you are coming back. But not only are you coming back here, but I'm sending you to the nations. And he said, at that moment, I decided I was going to business school, not to Bible college, which I thought was great. I'm going to business school because I'm going to go to places nobody else can go. And God's going to use my degree to help me create business in an area where the gospel is restricted. And I was like, man, you're crazy. But I love it. I love it. Because he has a passion to see the gospel go everywhere. We're fortunate. We live in a land that doesn't restrict the gospel. But they are starting to push back on the Bible. And it won't be long before they push back on the gospel. You need to pray that we have people in positions of authority that allow peace in the land and don't restrict the gospel message. Verse 3 goes on and says, It is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. For there is one God, one mediator, <clears throat> who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Now this is the gospel message that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to God except through Jesus' death and his resurrection, his sacrifice so our sins can be forgiven. That is the gospel message. There is one way. In Canada, you will hear many ways, but there's one way. There's one way, and it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, some people say, well, that, that is just so restrictive, that's so narrow-minded, that's so whatever. But it's truth. It's my truth. It's the truth of the word. And it's the truth that Paul told Timothy to make sure nothing gets in the way of. And if he had to tell the early church that, how much more do we have to be reminded of it today? That there is only one way. I love a lot of other people that are, have different religions and have different mindsets and I love them. I think they're great people. They live awesome lives. But they don't have the relationship with God that God created them to have. Simple as that. The gospel is still the only way. And Paul reminds Timothy, Timothy, this is the foundation. This is what you're meant to preach so we need to pray for a revelation of Jesus for all people. We need to pray for a revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's made available. I love it when Ophope gives a testimony of somebody from another religion that comes to youth. And we have a lot of kids that come to youth from other religions. We have a lot of people that come through our doors every day of the week for our ESL school that are from other religions. And I love it when I hear stories of people going to our teachers or going to Norell and saying, hey, I had a vision. I had a dream of this big banquet table. And I, I, there was this individual in white. What is that all about? I love it when kids come here and they experience the presence of God and their spirit comes alive and they begin to cry. Why? Because all of a sudden, life was shown to them. Real life, true life through the spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And all of a sudden, they began to go, what is going on? Why? Because they're encountering God. And what Jesus has made available, we cannot lose the importance 
of who Jesus is. And we have to continuously be praying for a revelation of who Jesus is. It's not a program that's going to do it. It's not an event that's going to do it. It's not no matter how many hamburgers we give away or bouncy houses we set up. It's going to be an encounter with who Jesus is that changes lives. And Paul reiterates that to the early church. He says, in every place of worship. Now, guys, this is for us. For every man in the room or watching online, for every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Now, this passage of Scripture, this one verse alone, I could probably preach on this for a couple of weeks, but let me give it to you just quickly this morning. Hang out to the bottom of your chair because this might get bumpy. (laughs) In every place of worship, in every church, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up. Holy hands is repentant hearts. Holy hands is hands set apart for the purposes of God. It's a repentant heart that gives us holy hands. It's a repentant heart that opens us up to what God wants to do. With holy hands lifted up, somebody that has been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and is determined to allow God to continuously transform them into the image of Jesus. I want men to have holy hands. Then he goes on, men free from anger. Men that have forgiveness in their heart. If you don't have forgiveness in your heart, you're carrying bitterness in your heart and anger is going to follow you everywhere that you go. You are going to bring anger home and you're going to take anger out on your kids and you're going to take anger out on your wife. Think about it. If your husband has the worst day of his life at work and he comes in the door and he's mad at everybody at work, who gets to experience that? I know none of you are going to say me, but let's face it. If I go home upset because of something that has happened, Andrew's like, what is wrong with you? Now, I have a very strong wife. Uh, And I admit it. I was... 32 years old when we got married. I was very stubborn. I owned my own house. I had a job, cars, you know, the whole thing. I was all that and a bag of chips (laughs) in my mind. And I was very stubborn. And it took an amazing woman to teach me how stubborn I was. (laughs) And allow me the time to be transformed. Some of you guys haven't got it yet. And you're carrying things that you shouldn't be carrying because you're not ready to let it go. And it's causing trouble in your marriage because you're being too stubborn or angry. And your marriage is in trouble. I'm your pastor, I hear stories, (laughs) it's my job. But my job is to also pray for you and challenge you. Don't let Satan have a foothold in anger in your life. It's going to destroy you and it's going to destroy your family. It's going to destroy your kids. And your kids are going to follow your example into their family. And generationally, you'll set something up that you cannot tear down. Paul says, I want men with pure hands. I want men that aren't angry. They live in forgiveness. They know how to forgive. They know how to let go. They know how to move forward and not allow things from their past to hinder them today. And he said, I want men free from controversy. I want men free from controversy that are living a pure life, that they're not living one way over there and another way over here or one way behind closed doors and another way in public. They're not wearing a nice suit and treating their family terribly. They're not wearing a nice suit and treating their employees terribly. They're not wearing a nice suit and cheating the government. Free of controversy. Free of controversy. That's what Paul calls the early church to. God calls us to that today. 
Man, he calls us to be men that can stand up, that what we do in private can be seen in public. To be those men that can lead our families, that when something is going on, that we can stand up and say, no, that's a temptation. We don't need to grab that fruit. All right? But we can't do that if we're fighting with everybody around us. And we can't do that if we don't have character. And we're not allowing God to develop that character in us. Think about it. Paul writes to the Ephesians church again outside of writing to Timothy. And he says this to the Ephesians church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The example that husbands are supposed to have for their family is the example of Christ who would lay his life down so that they could be saved. I, I always use this when I'm talking and, and doing, excuse me, doing pre-marriage counseling for individuals that are getting married. I always use this passage of scripture, especially when we're talking about vows, because you know, in the vows, you know, a lot of times it says, be submissive to your husband. And a lot of times it's like, mm, I don't know about that. But just think about this, ladies. I always challenge the, the ladies this way. Just think about it. If every man followed Paul's instruction to us as husbands, that we would love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for them, if they would literally lay their lives down for you, isn't that an individual that you'd be submissive to? Isn't that an individual that you would follow? Isn't that an individual, but when they stand up and say, no, don't touch that, you'd say, yeah, no, let's not touch that. You see, when Paul writes to the early church, he's setting a foundation of what God desires from us. And so men, he wasn't trying to put women down. He was elevating them. And men... He was challenging us to be the men of God that God calls us to be so that we can lead well. And it will bring transformation, not just in our home, but in our communities. Jesus gives his life for the church. Husbands are to do the same for their wives and for their families. I believe that Paul actually in this chapter as he's writing this he actually refers to especially when he's talking about men he actually refers to psalm chapter 24 when the psalmist writes who can come into the presence of god the earth is the lord's and everything in it the the world and <clears throat> all who live in it for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters who may ascend the mount of the lord who may stand in his holy place who can come into the presence of God? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in idols or swear by any false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. And I love this. Such is a generation of those who seek him, who seek his face, the God of Jacob. The ones that get to experience the presence of God are those with a clean hands and a pure heart who can ascend into the presence of God. How do we get into the presence of God? By repentance in our heart. That we invite Jesus to forgive us and remove that sin and then daily we allow him to convict us and Paul writes, daily we die to self so that we can live for Christ. Daily we lift him up in our lives and daily we follow his example in our lives. Whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. That's what God calls us to. And who can ascend the hill of the Lord? And whose generation, whose generation will experience God? Those that determine in their hearts are going to have clean hands and a pure heart. And they get in the presence of God. They make prayer a foundation of their life. They understand an urgency for prayer, an urgency for the loss, a conviction for holiness in us. And I kind of made this one up, family righteousness. That we lead our families in a way that honors God and a desire for sound doctrine in our life. So let me challenge you. If there's something in this today that's convicting you, then that's probably an area where you need to make some changes. 
If you're listening to this today, whether here or online, and you're like, well, man, <clears throat> this is all good. I've heard this before. I'm, I'm living in this. Keep being that example to somebody else. Keep walking that out and keep growing in what God is calling you to. After the first service, a young lady came to me and said, Pastor Mark, I applied to this Bible college a few weeks ago, and they told me I couldn't be a pastor, so they weren't going to let me in. I was like, well, you applied to the wrong school. Don't let anybody tell you you can't lead. God has called every single person to lead. He's called us all for the same thing. Jesus didn't die one way for men and another way for women. He died for us all to give us freedom that we could honor him with our lives and we could lead people to him. So let me encourage you. If there's an area of this that you're just like, and you're frustrated inside right now, that's the Holy Spirit saying you need to make a change. And you might be here, and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. You're seeking out spiritual things. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this, God is speaking to your heart and saying, this is what you need. There's something going on inside saying, this is the transformation you need in your life. And you don't know fully what it is, but it's just Holy Spirit telling you God loves you. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan for your life. And he wants to have relationship with you. And it comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through what Jesus did on the cross for us where he died, that our sins could be forgiven and we could have relationship with an almighty creator. And if that's you today, I'd love to simply just lead you in a prayer that would accept what Jesus has done and invite God into your life and allow him to take you on this journey of growing in what he has in store for your life. Whether you're in this room or you're watching us online, if that's you, I'm going to ask you just to simply bow your head. All of us in the room, just simply bow our heads and just say, Holy Spirit, is there something you want me to take out of this message today? What is it you want me to apply into my life today? And first of all, if it's you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, then I want to lead you in a simple prayer that will start that. And if that's you today, and you say, Pastor Mark, at one time I was following Jesus, but I've pushed him away, or... Maybe you never have, and right now you're just like, man, I know I need to get right with God. If that's you, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. But before I do, I want to know who wants to pray it with me. Just go look across the room from my right and your left. If that's you, just look up and say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank you. My right and your left, yeah. Thank you. And in the middle, if that's you today, just simply look at me and say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank you. And over to my left and your right, if that's you. Thank you. Simply right there in your seat and online, a little thing's going to come up saying, I need Jesus. Just click on that. That just lets us know you're praying with us. Just simply pray this. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Remove that sin and fill me with your spirit. Give me new life. Transform me. In Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for every individual here today. Lord, for anyone that feels that they've been pushed down because of some false teaching somewhere along the way that restricted them from stepping into something that you're calling them to. In Jesus' name, Lord, I just break that off. And, and Father, I just pray that you'll renew vision and you'll renew who they are in you. And Father, I, I pray for any man here that is not living with the character that they need to live. Holy Spirit, that you'll do what I can't do. You'll speak spirit to spirit. You'll bring conviction where it's needed but also they will see your grace and your restoration and your freedom that is meant for their life. So Holy Spirit, I pray today you would transform all of us into the church you desire us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this song as we close.